for those of you who uh, don't remember the living yesterday, <laughs> I don't know. Um, the usual quick summary uh, and welcome back. Uh, first, a reminder uh, we will cover the lecture that we had to miss last week on Wednesday. We will cover it on Thursday afternoon, three to five, room three in this building. It's downstairs and should be less warm uh, at all. So we have the option, and uh, I would recommend that your choice, but the other one should be a little bit less uh, overwhelming. So we try that one. Um, in terms of where we are, uh, oh, also uh, the usual uh, reminder, uh, these lectures are being recorded. Uh, so please, uh, your privacy uh, is at stake. Uh, smile, you, you'll be fit. As they say. Also, uh, those online, please uh, remember to turn off your video. Um, Teams being what it is uh, enables us to turn off the audio, but not the videos. Don't ask, it is. The joke, as you know, is always that no matter what you think about the existential threats of AI, whether you believe them or not, we will be always safe because Windows will not enable anyone to run anything. They're complex. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, out of the defense is Windows crashing uh, all the time, and AI will not have us alive. So thank you, Windows, for making sure that with a precognition of, of a foundation kind of style, um, don't want to repent you as an office, uh, you have built in that resilience against AI. Um, never thought that all the crashing was done so that AI would not pay for it. Uh, but now done. Um, so Windows uh, allowing, um, we're going to start uh, looking at some of the uh, challenges that are going on of uh, AI and that's the chat GPT, and we'll see we clean that. Um, it's this year flavor of AI, trust me, next year there will be something else. Had I given this course on the ethical AI last year, we would have been talking about something else. But having said that, it's interesting enough. Uh, at the beginning of this lecture, we also covered a little bit what ChatGPT or any bad language model um, has behind the uh, sort of facade, what's under the hood. In this particular lecture, um, we covered the challenges. And the one uh, generated by AI. Um, the um, point uh, that I wish to remind everybody is that this is a chapter in a much bigger book, the bigger book being the digital revolution, and how we approach this digital revolution from a philosophical perspective. So, this it really is a philosophy class. It's a 21st century philosophy of us, so we try to um, uh, interact with real world problems. In a different context, uh, maybe next year, um, uh, I try to change the course every year. Uh, the distinction um, to understand what kind of philosophy we're doing in this context is quite simple. I start from there and then back to the AI. If any of you has been exposed to anything else at all, uh, you know that there are some big names and then the followers. So there's um, Socrates and the Socratic philosophers, Plato and the Platonists, Aristotle, the Aristotelians, etc. Uh, et so Heidegger and the Heideggerians, Wittgenstein and the Wittgensteinians, uh, and so on. So what happens is that you uh, have a moment of growth. Uh, imagine going up and down uh, through history. You go up in this uh, curve and you have um, great research dealing with philosophical problems. That great research becomes scholastic and the followers start dealing with philosophers' problems. Now, philosophical problems, we are all interested in. Philosophical problems, nobody gives much of attention, shall we say. To that becomes an internal game. People talk to each other. 
and goes down and down and down and disappears. I mean, who cares what philosophers do in these days? Many departments. Until no, there is a crisis, a call to action, something happens in the world, and people say, where is our philosophical understanding here? We have a conceptual deficit. We have problems we haven't seen before. We need to understand and redesign our world seriously. For example, not, not only Athens said that, but don't disappear, but then in this part of the world, Christianity happens. So, boom, you go to Augustine, you come to finance, and then you know, the scholasticism, nobody cares, but then the scientific revolution happens, and boom, you have Descartes and all the modern philosophy, etc. You have the crisis of uh, foundations in physics, in mathematics, boom, you know, things uh, happen again. On up and down, up and down. So the idea is that philosophy is always there, ready to interact. But the um, attention to philosophical problems get distracted because we fall in love with our own internal debate. Once that happens, society doesn't care anymore. So the view is that this digital revolution is one of those fundamental historical moments when philosophy comes all back and says, dear philosophy, could you please stop talking about yourself to yourself within your circle? Because we have things to understand that are at a conceptual level too complex to be left to anything else. We need philosophy to understand the digital revolution. If that is more or less the right perspective, <clears throat> you can imagine that we are at the not beginning of a new uh, summer, to use the AI uh, terminology, a new summer of philosophical thinking. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of philosophical uh, discussion, ethical discussion, for example, these days about our present and future. Part of this uh, philosophy of the digital revolution, if you like, um, is the ethics of AI, I told just a chapter. Within that, we cover a few topics, which I keep telling anybody, they're just appetizers, so that you can pick them up and run. Remember, <clears throat> we want to have philosophers, we don't want to have followers. Uh, and the you know, philosophers uh, will hopefully find these new scenes of interest and help us to make sense of the current sort of situation and how we design uh, a better future. We started this lecture some uh, hours ago, and we uh, made a difference. We have a moment to about I think we have to turn this off. Shall we turn the editing off so we can hear what we had sweat? Can anyone help? Um, you know, afterward. So just a moment. We're turning off the. Um, uh, Pulling uh, yes. I think we also yeah, need, one. you know how to do it. Okay. This is some noise. I don't know where it comes from, but it should yeah. disappear. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Back to us, uh, we, we started looking at, as I said, um, different ways of interacting AI. Um, one, as I told you, is as a marriage between some kind of intelligence and engineering. The other one is as a divorce between agency and intelligence. That's the road we took. Then in, in that gap, we find a lot of uh, opportunities, but also challenges. We're now uh, looking at some of the challenges. I will focus just on ChatGPT and give you a specific example. It's recent. But some of the things that we're going to see apply uh, across the board. So this is uh, the International Bar Association, um, no, the global voice of the legal profession. And I'd like to stress how they describe the AI system. Now, first of all, uh, what we're really talking about is machine learning. Um, we're no longer talking about expert systems um, as in the past. Remember the distinction between symbolic AI based on mathematical logic versus um, uh, narrow network based 
uh, statistical um, uh, AI. So if you read that sentence, it's you can tell that they are trying to say something without saying, saying anything wrong. It's a typical, uh, for anyone has talked here, typical sentence from a student who hopes that by saying enough, the interpretation of who reads the text will be interpreted in such a way that the interpretation will be correct. But you could read this also in a very incorrect way. Um, so it's sufficiently open to interpretation to make sure that it's not incorrect. An AI system equipped with up-to-date and accurate case law and regulatory data. Equipped. Now, equipped sounds like it has a database. Now, what did I tell you about oh, ChatGPT and all that stuff? It's not a database. I would be disappointed if the International Bar Association were to think, of course they don't, but if they were to think that machine learning is AI equipped with a database, because it isn't. Could be a game changer for some firms. Could be for some. Anything could be for someone. So this sentence that shows you how you know, carefully positioning happens, normally when they are lawyer, um, but also the misunderstanding. For those of you who were here yesterday, remember now the comparison between uh, ChatGPT and a pocket calculator. It doesn't work for many reasons, but one reason why it does work is that your pocket calculator is not a database. Knows, quote unquote, how to calculate a formula. This is some of the uh, sort of uh, advantages uh, brought uh, about by ChatGPT. And I'm just looking now at the you know, legal profession. It could be uh, extended to many others. Drop, for example, legal and research in terms of documents. It works anyway. Document review, drafting documents. I'll leave you there to read, uh, but you can imagine what's, what lies behind. Anything that's got to do with handling documents. Remember yesterday, the white collars, white collars, um, just a quick summary, brown collars, they deal with um, uh, uh, bioware, no, agriculture. Then you have the blue collars, hardware, industry, and then the uh, white collars, software, uh, just to be memorable. If you are in any business where essentially your work depends 100% on handling some kind of content, it could be you know, from the uh, secretary uh, to the president and or the VC of this university, uh, the, uh, the director, is all documents anyway. If you never handle anything that is a 3D object that needs to be transformed, then obviously, uh, Drafting documents, document review, uh, that kind of research, or other things that are much more in the legal profession, due diligence, legal advice, compliance, legal chatbots. A simple example, uh, we in Europe, we have uh, a series, no, it's also a problem in the United States, um, but in Europe it's significant how you uh, harmonize uh, legislation. Of course, the effort from the EU is enormous, but there's plenty of uh, different terminology, um, different interpretations, local legislation that needs to be harmonized cross border. In the past, uh, something that I remember saying uh, a long, long time ago, this is not going to work. The assumption was that we would be building ontologies. Now, there was another appropriation by computer science of terminology that was 100% philosophical. Um, a ontology in computer science has got nothing to do or very little with uh, what we've been discussing this course, but it's a way of, if you like, having a taxonomy, precise, unambiguous of all the entities in that context. So you could have, for example, an ontology, that was an example of, for some of you, uh, is archaeology, um, of a shop that sells um, videos or CDs. 
meaning that the shop has a precise and unique unambiguous uh, description of every item and every item has that description that you uh, unique identifier now if you think that that is doable um in say a shop then you could think that was the past that you could build an ontology of things online in fact some some of the discussions they went nowhere of semantic web were based on oh all we need is to build the ultimate big universal ontology of everything that is around which is great as long as you don't get into the level of abstraction remember we did that a long time ago the chairs and the furniture in this room how do you describe them? are these uh, chairs for example those ones are connected those are not are the same object or not you start getting the granularity said no no individual standalone chair versus chairs connected but some of this can actually be connected to other chairs so connectable you lost as soon as you do not agree on what level of abstraction is the right one at which you are communicating people might be misinterpreting uh, etc so is this a table is it a desk is this uh, thing no like, like more of a special desk compared to the other desks that's what the computer lost because there is no ultimate description of the world so that was the wrong kind of philosophy and led to a huge amount of waste of money today no and that of course uh, was very popular especially in the professions medical and legal they tried their best to build these ontologies it was an attempt to harmonize legislation so if you have a specific crime in say um france is that the same crime described in the same way that leads to the same consequences if you are in Spain or Germany or Italy? Well, for example, I've been told uh, by colleagues here who are real experts is that one crime might require, for example, uh, a special um, treatment as a processing by three uh, judges. Uh, another one might have a completely different, uh, same kind of quote unquote crime, might go through a completely different procedure in another context. So the harmonization of this is a nightmare. And it's the kind of nightmare that AI is good at. Remember, difficult, complex. It's not difficult, it's complex in the sense in which we saw this uh, yesterday. So um, legal advice, due diligence, compliance, legal chapters, or simply harmonization is one of the things where uh, all these tools will make a big difference. They also make the other difference. This uh, you can find in any context, but of course the legal profession is particularly key, copyright infringement. When you do um, use uh, data, training data that may or may not be used for that purpose. Now, one thing that I like to stress in that point, but of course we could uh, have a whole course on just this topic, so I'll, I'll be rather quick. Remember seeds and appetizers, but copyright infringement uh, is an interesting debate that has been revived it never went away but today is particularly pressing because of the way in which the large language models are trained on data that you find out there now you find them out there um point number one um we know which exactly which databases have been used for chat gpt3 i go by memory so double check as usual uh, but i think we also know about 3.5 we do not know anymore about four. Remember, um, so-called open AI, now better called opaque, uh, uh, or for opaque, not for open, uh, AI has stopped providing any information about what they do and how they do it. Um, the infringement uh, is happens, of course, for people who are not doing this profession, so forgive me for all, all the others, is when you pick up data that uh, were there, for example, for fair use, and you use them for a commercial purpose, and then you sell the product. Now, this is a bit ambiguous because, of course, you're not selling the data, no matter what some people think. Um, of course, you're not keeping the data, no matter what some people think. It's not a database. But the training happened on those data. Should someone not reward people who put the data there, maybe just for fair use? Open debate. So it's not that we know or we don't. Um, but it's an interesting debate. It's one of those things where we have a bit of a deficit in terms of understanding. This is uh, the um, at the top is the problem with training data. 
If you look down here, this is another copyright problem, is not only who's input, but also who's output. You use these tools, uh, say, for example, for image production, uh, and uh, imagine you produce a whole um, comics using massively uh, DALI, perfectly doable. Um, who owns the copyright on the images, some of which might look a lot like images on which the thing has been trained. Uh, trying to use DAO here and see how it works, etc. Recently, I uh, just I don't know anything about this stuff, so I'm not a graphic design designer, totally hopeless. So I said, look, please reproduce a robot, 2D, black and white, Bansky style, with flowers and scents. Um, I won't show it to you because it's horrible, <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, you refine the prompt and it gets nicer, etc. Now, the output looks a lot like Bansky really a lot because of course you just told them like Bansky style. Uh, is this something that belongs to Luciano? Um, 100%? No, Bansky probably wouldn't care less, but someone could care more about their own production and how etc. this style. So again, open problems, we're not quite sure, we don't know. The invitation for also anyone online listening is let's try not to extend good lessons from the past to cover the present and the future. They may or may not work. If you look at all these problems, liability, moral rights, etc., the temptation is we have the law, we extend the law, it will cover this as well. Or we have an ethical framework, or we have a conceptual understanding. Whatever framework comes from, as we said in the past, uh, modernity, all I need is to stretch it. Maybe add something, maybe modify something else, but I have something that already works. All I need is to whoop, cover also. There may be a mistake. Sometimes it could work, but I would be surprised if all these novelties were just more of the same for which you can simply adapt, rectify, upgrade all tools. Not a criticism for the old tools, but an acknowledgement that the knowledge of the problem requires some new thinking. We cannot be that lazy. It can't simply be, look, for example, OpenAI, ChatGPT, ChatGPT was uh, by the uh, data authority in Italy, was um, charged with the uh, claim that uh, it was uh, not abused because it was trained on and was using consistently data from Italian citizens, it did not have a particular threshold in terms of who could participate and who could not, 13 years old, for example, et cetera. And it was, it is, was unreliable, providing information that are not trustworthy. Now, the 13 age is when this happened, Again, on record, lots of debate, interviews, et cetera. So look, the 13, it just, they will just add a click. If you use that chat GPT today, it's like, are you a, yes, well, problem solved. So clearly it didn't make any difference whatsoever. Unreliability, well, that is in the design of the thing. It's a statistical tool. Either you tell me you cannot use it or you have consent, it's nature, but you can't simply say as it is, but not what it is. And in fact, that also went through out of, of the window. So if you look for, for your biography, uh, assuming that you know, ChatGPT wants to say anything about you, it might get it wrong. Well, we have to cope with that or stop using it. But we cannot get a statistical tool giving us the certainty of a deductive system, all symbolic. Either, remember, either you don't understand how it works or what you're really saying is that it should not be used full stop. There is no third alternative. Like, oh, no, no, I understand how it works. It just has to work better. It doesn't. <laughs> it's a statistical tool, intrinsically open to probabilities that may not fit the 100% certainty of two plus two plus four. The other, the other point that is using you know, data from Italian citizen, et cetera, as I should, should acknowledge, but, well, that is you know, part of the training and some of the problems we have here. Uh, the, privacy, uh, the accessibility, uh, and so on. Um, 
of course, because of that, uh, the, the only thing that OpenAI could do was to stop anyone uh, using uh, ChatGPT in Italy. Uh, of course, uh, it was a, a geographically bounded um, IP sort of based uh, block, uh, and uh, it didn't last long enough. Uh, so it's back uh, on being used um, with uh, virtually no negligible differences. You wouldn't see what has changed. Um, some of the problems uh, are also, uh, as I said, uh, privacy here. Misinformation, um, the so-called hallucinations. Um, I'll tell you more about this in a moment. But also problems about content moderations and censorship. We already saw this. Remember the steak? Um, no. Is a, a horse steak not acceptable, but uh, a normal uh, uh, steak uh, that is acceptable? Who decides which steak is acceptable, if at all? Uh, deceptions, of course, plenty. Um, Actually, I need to show you something before I forget um, this morning. Um, and uh, on this misinformation, manipulation, and hallucinations, just one word, something that I haven't written yet. So um, we need two or three minutes, so be patient. Back in time, we are now half a century ago, shall we say. And uh, there are two disciplines that are emerging, two um, areas of human knowledge that we haven't had before. One will become artificial intelligence. It starts as, in some cases, as cybernetics. The other one, which has huge and long and profound and fundamental uh, roots, in, uh, especially in the 19th century, especially in Germany sometimes, or France, is uh, experimental psychology, which will become what we know today as neuroscience. Uh, my wife will not be happy, uh, but um, uh, she's the chair of neuroscience in Oxford. And when she studied as an undergraduate uh, in the same college where uh, uh, Emmy went, not so much for privacy, uh, is all things you find online. Um, Williams College, one of the most prestigious um, undergraduate places in, in the United States, there was no neuroscience. All you could do was to put together a bit of biology, a bit of medicine, a bit of psychology, a bit of philosophy of mind, a bit of this and that and so on, to build something that later, when she went and went to uh, Yale, became something known as neuroscience. And no, no, you're lucky to be one of the pioneers. There was no such, this, such thing. Uh, so these two disciplines are emerging. And in the history of disciplines, what normally happens is that when a new discipline emerges, it needs a technical vocabulary. If he emerges rather quickly, he needs that vocabulary to buy an app. He borrows that vocabulary from any other discipline around. We already know, uh, for example, that when political science and sociology emerged, and emerged very rapidly, they had to look around and say, OK, how do we deal with power, for example? Or, as we said in the other lecture, hope. Uh, or interest and so on. So when social sciences at large emerge, the discipline that was around that dealt with all this was theology. And so you find that some of the vocabulary in political science comes straight from theology. Imagine all the debate in Hobbes about uh, sovereignty. It's straight from you know, the power of God, et cetera, et cetera, the church, the structure. So, it's not an accident, an accident that you find some representations that look like the state is almost like this godlike figure. So the borrowing sometimes is not confusing. No one should be confused about you know, theology and political power unless you live in a theocracy where the vocabulary then becomes a total mess. Because of course you have the theological vocabulary, the political science vocabulary in a single thing, and you live in uh, Iran or in Italy just you know, uh, 150 years ago um, or something. Um, Rome uh, before 1870. Um, uh, back to us, these two disciplines are emerging. Cybernetics, AI, computer science on the one hand, the other, uh, science. Cybernetics and AI need a vocabulary about agency. They need to talk about something that is emerging that has the ability to keep records, memory. The uh, 
capacity of recording and also um, capturing data from the environment, computer vision, the uh, ability to use this data to improve its performance, machine learning, all the vocabulary you find there comes straight from the only disciplines we ever had about agency. There are human agency. So computer science, to oversimplify, borrows massively from human agency, hallucinations. Of course, no one in his dreams should think that these machines have hallucinations. It's borrowing the vocabulary, generating confusion, of course, then. Hmm? That, that should be clear. Remember when Alan Turing is writing, I know you know, it's just so that you know that I also know that you know, et cetera, et cetera. When Alan Turing is writing, a computer is a human being, literally. He's the one who changed the, the meaning of computer. There are advertisements at the time where people now, are advertising for now, new positions as computer, et cetera, et cetera, and they are advertising for people who will go there and do computation, normally women. So uh, it was a job for women uh, at the time, uh, we're talking uh, so early uh, 20th century, where you needed rooms full of people who did all the calculations. Those were computers in the original sense. It's after Turing that we start talking about computer as a machine. So boring, taking, et cetera. Now, why the other side? Because why computer science is boring from human, say, human agency, Meanwhile, when neuroscience emerges, it needs to be able to talk scientifically about something wet, wishy-washy, a little bit strange, like the brain. And as it moves on, it needs to talk about the brain more and more precisely, scientifically. He looks around, and what is the vocabulary available to talk about the brain, if not the vocabulary used by a computer scientist? It becomes a neural network. The brain processes data, stimuli, it becomes a machine. Now, that also should generate no confusion if you know what's happened. Fast forward today, neuroscience talks as if the brain were a computer. That's where vocabulary came from. AI talks as if the, the computer were a, a human form of agency. That's where the vocabulary comes from. Put them together, the mess is almost inevitable. Because of course we talk about hallucinations. Now the poor gentleman, the engineer at Google, who then thought that you know, that piece of uh, metal had become conscious, you have to be understanding uh, inevitably. We are building the vocabulary to be confused. Now of course no, these things do not have hallucinations of any kind. They make statistical errors. Now statistical error not so funny. Uh, no, no hallucinations. That's much better as long as we know what we're talking about. For those of you who think so, how stupid the current generation, remember all of us, all of us, when you read uh, the, the power of that particular car that you're buying, HP, you know what HP stands for, horse power. Because the only way of calculating the power of that car at the time when the car emerged was to compare around, and that was worth two, four, a hundred, 15,000, a, a gazillion horses power. No. But of course, no one in his right mind should look no, under the hood and see how many horses are there, hmm? as we are doing literally with AI these days, okay? So, uh -huh, so funny, you're still looking for horsepower. Well, our culture today is looking for horsepowers in the engine. Hmm. Other example, we all say that, and we don't get that wrong, but we still talk about the sun rises. No, that the sun doesn't go anywhere. It hasn't been going anywhere forever and culturally since Copernicus. <laughs> and yet the vocabulary is so strong, so embedded, so radically within our language that sun rises and well, uh, at some point uh, it goes to bed. Um, of course not. Now, as long as, therefore, we do not get misled by no, hallucinations <laughs> generated by our own language, that is perfectly fine. Um, of course, previously we discussed this, content moderation uh, to the size, digital deceptions, it's all over the place. 
And this is something that I want, I just say for you uh, this morning, uh, you check the news and uh, you think, oh, I need to show this at the classroom. Um, so this um, uh, today, uh, you can actually check is June 26, MIT Technology Review. So please uh, have a look. And it says uh, the title is junk websites filled with AI generated text are pulling in money from programmatic advertisement. I didn't do that on purpose. For those of you who are not with us, we discussed programmatic advertisement yesterday. Mm -hmm. So when you start feeling that you have a crystal ball, no, it's just logic. If then, if A, then B. If one of the problems where I is manipulation of human beings and our autonomy, how does that happen? Through massive advertisement. What is behind our massive advertisement? Uh, programmatic advertisement. We showed the picture, I showed you the picture how, how skyrocketing the amount of money we're spending on this all over the place. We're talking about billions of dollars every year to make sure that you buy, you see this thing as opposed to this thing on a website. Bingo, you didn't take a moment. No, no, you build plenty of junk uh, websites filled with AI and you sort of hijack all their money to be uh, spent on advertisement to nobody about junk. Are we wasting opportunities here? Stack. Uh, what we could do with this technology would be saving uh, the world and ourselves on the world. <laughs> Meanwhile, we are entertaining ourselves to stupidity. Okay, so um, there is a lot of um, transformation in all this. Now, stepping back now to the general point, uh, there is a massive disruption. Remember, those are the five points that I showed you yesterday, uh, including job market. It's a matter of um, uh, Degree uh, versus pace, of course. Um, the degree is intense, but the pace is what really makes this uh, staggering. The pace at which the disruption is happening uh, is uh, unprecedented if you compare the digital revolution to the industrial and the agricultural. The agricultural, I've said this more than once, forgive me, took millennia to be absorbed by society. When we finally became urban, and we finally, at least in this corner of the world, uh, invented a way of writing, et cetera, therefore legislation and so on. It, we were still discussing this when Plato was around. You know, thousands of years later, we were still like, oh, wow, look what happened. The industrial took centuries, and we're still feeling that we are kind of getting there. Uh, just imagine you know, what happened to traffic, uh, jobs and so on. The digital is taking decades. Clearly, the compression of time required to absorb this radical transformation is immense. So obviously, uh, there is much need for fast reaction, but also some understanding that if we make mistakes, well, we have to cut ourselves some slack. And as I was uh, saying uh, to Kia, speaking of language uh, the other day, uh, slack is always gets cut. I don't know why, but no one sort of, uh, does anything else with slack. Uh, you cut it all the time uh, for the English speaker uh, among us. If you have other examples of not doing something like cutting it to a slack, it always gets cut. Um, but so we need to cut some slack. Um, impact, present cost, future benefits. Uh, this is also a complete unfair um, reorientation of our uh, priorities. Um, the benefits will be felt increasingly in the future if we do the right thing. If we do the wrong thing, we won't be even here. But assuming that this digital revolution has positive effects, the disruption is now, the positive effects will be uh, hugely uh, so, uh, in the future. So one way of doing that uh, is minimizing a little bit that sort of uh, misalignment and trying with some social safety net, some welfare, uh, some benefits re-education, whatever it takes to smooth the difference between how rapid and sometimes even tragic the impact of digital revolution is today and how wonderful it might be in the future. If all the benefits are coming, well, it might be necessary to borrow from the future. Um, uh, in a country like Italy, that's a bad idea because we've been doing that uh, for decades, uh, borrowing from the future constantly, and the future has stopped being uh, credit worth it, so to speak. Uh, we keep borrowing and borrowing, and the uh, debt uh, increases. But in countries that have not done that, they may still have the opportunity of borrowing more from the future and spend now so that the smooth uh, transition is less tragic. Benefits, uh, things like the universal basic 
uh, capital rather than income, so something that citizens could have access to. Uh, imagine anyone who wants to uh, have a, a startup or a change job, borrow some money to improve their conditions, for example, taking a course and so on. This should be something that happens by default on a regular basis. Now, of course, as a philosopher, uh, just a moment here, reflection, and we move on. Um, you know that uh, the ultimate end of history is to stop having a job, not stop working, because uh, we might want to do things because we like to do things. I mean, it's, hey, if you want to take care of the roses, that's, that's work, but you may not have to. Um, and the idea that uh, having a job is a destiny, um, not really. No, we will look at this when we discuss the utopian thinking. I mean, there is no utopia in which you have a job. <laughs> Think about it. paradise or anything else. People don't have jobs. They don't work in utopia. They have stopped working. Whatever it is, maybe it's holiday forever for everybody. So this idea that having a job is uh, the right thing to do and the goal of society, well, not really. The goal of society is to have an income, not to have a job. And that's the difference. If I could have an income without having a job, I know everyone would subscribe immediately. Income without a job? Yeah, me first, obviously. Um, the idea that there is a need for a job is because the job is the only way of having an income. Simple as that. So social disruption happens not because there are no jobs, but because there are no incomes. In a society in which there are no jobs and everybody's wealthy, you don't find people in the squares. You find people in the squares when there are no jobs because they don't have money, Money being the only way you know, to get it through a job. Now, having a job is a wonderful thing, uh, but not having it is even better if we can afford it. Um, inequality, uh, that's the taxation uh, idea. Uh, we live in one of the most uh, unequal society I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, I think we have to go back to, I don't know, the pharaohs in Egypt, uh, no places that we have read uh, in the history uh, textbook to find like five people <laughs> Owing everything and anything and the rest, like so, uh, slaving around. So, so, I'm sure that history presents uh, amazing examples of this degree of social inequality. But the way in which social inequality has gone down and then picked up again, uh, staggeringly, uh, that is unique uh, in, in uh, our world. I mean, normally we have seen history becoming less and less uh, unequal in terms of. Uh, who owns what? Who earns what? As you all know, I mean, I don't have to repeat it. Google will help us. I don't know. We have maybe 10, 20 people in the world who owns more than the rest of well, the other two or three billion people put together. <laughs> this is just, it's, it's, it's insane. Uh, something has to be done. It's called taxation. Um, and uh, for all the Americans listening to this, uh, I know it's a bad word and that we shouldn't be using it. But no, welcome to the real world in which uh, people have real chances, opportunities, equality, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't want to have that, well, we keep going uh, down the uh, drain. And skills, we covered this uh, the other day, you know, uh, sort of languages, the languages spoken by information. So how do we do and what do we do with all this? We watch, sorry, we look at all this um, uh, for uh, previous points. The next step, uh, given uh, what AI is not and what it is, uh, the kind of principles to handle the challenges uh, caused by this divorce and um, uh, the sort of uh, clear or clearer understanding of what challenges are there, is to assess the technology. The assessment is called auditing. Now, auditing, um, let me just uh, give you a bit of a, a philological uh, insight in the most important legislation we have around these days is coming, um, is the AI Act. Just a couple of points and then uh, I'll tell you more through the slides. One, uh, how amazing it was uh, for anyone following the debate on AI existential risk. Remember that letter uh, by uh, Altman and uh, a number of other sort of uh, very famous people. Um, wasn't also uh, the usual Elon Musk, uh, the bad guy, this uh, sort of, uh, of course, uh, signing it, I think so, et cetera. Well, um, one of the things that I thought was, again, staggering, but amazing, was that it was calling for legislation. There was not a note, 
not a foot, not a reference to the actual legislation one existing and two coming. Now, there's a, uh, a very valuable uh, report published by uh, Stanford, uh, the Center for AI, and if it's them, uh, is a regular sort of, uh, uh, monitoring uh, report which tells you which bits of legislation are already available about AI. We're talking about hundreds, not one or two. Now, before you sign a letter saying, oh, we need that, wouldn't you spend, I don't know, 15 minutes on Wikipedia? 15, I mean, and I say 15, no, because it's a quarter of an hour. Uh, you want to ten, make it 10? That's OK. Uh, no, there is no legislation. Yes, there is. <laughs> no principles. Yes, there are. <laughs> and in fact, you could subscribe to any of those. Uh, if you are even you know, remotely serious about what you're saying, uh, you would have not said, and therefore, we are subscribing to the ethical principles put forward by the EU or the OECD or anyone in his uncle, because there are hundreds, as we know. Or we could have you know, already following the hundreds of bits of legislation everywhere else. Or you could say, and we welcome the EU legislation that is forthcoming. It's a matter of weeks, not even months. Instead, the first thing that Altman said, as you probably know, Reuters, as soon as they came to know, congratulations, as Reuters, just me knowing it, like seriously, like two weeks ago, you asked for, for, for legislation. I don't know. We don't want that. Uh, that's, that's too much. No, no really? No, I don't think so. Uh, that's not good for business. Okay. Now, the problem is not those people uh, not putting forward these letters. Are the colleagues signing them? And I have debates with some of them, like, how naive can you be? This is a trap. It's a classic in sort of, uh, misinformation. Make as much noise as possible, existential risk, save us from the end of the world so that nothing changes. For the Italians in this room, you know that, that that famous phrase, everything must change so nothing will ever change. Il gatto parla, the leopard. It's a classic in Italian literature and it's becoming a bit of a classic also in English literature. It's translated. If you haven't read it, it's a great book. The leopard, il gatto parla. It is a great uh, southern Sicilian guy, you know, the prince said, you know, the revolution is coming and the best way to cope with the revolution is to make everything look like it's changing so that nothing will change. In fact, nothing changes. So make a big noise so that nothing changes. And as soon as they know that something is changing, I don't like it. But. So back to us, that's a little note about AI and auditing. Um, uh, the other little note on auditing and AI is the terminology. Um, when you look at the AI Act, which has been going through a, a number of regions and so, uh, compromises, it's also a political document, of course, so parties at the end of the European Parliament had to agree on the final uh, text and some of the uh, most controversial bits these days are about bio um, uh, technologies, no, sorry, uh, biometric technology, technology that no, uh, used to uh, recognize, identify, etc., individuals, monitor people, uh, and so on. But in that context, if you look at the vocabulary, if you do a search, the word audit or auditing doesn't really appear in the text. It appears much later in something that, uh, in a sort of biological sense, would be comparable to our spinal cord, evolutionally speaking. It appears in some of the bits, which I'm not quite sure are, they're still there. I haven't checked uh, recently. But please note again online, um, audit or auditing appears in the old versions and the first documentary uh, sort of elements that support the AI Act. Because um, there are, there's a lot of uncertainty about who is going to do it and how. So who is going to evaluate AI according to what sort of methodology is very uncertain. If you start using the word audit and auditing, you're pointing immediately to what is existent right now. Right now, there's a lot of auditing going on. It's done normally by many companies, but there are four, the four sisters are the main ones. I go by memory, PwC, EY, and another couple of uh, them. Again, Google uh, auditing, there are four there, and they have most of the market. Something that, again, you find uh, online, I'm not breaching any uh, non-disclosure agreement, NDA, for the philosophers among us. Um, if you're lucky, you will have to sign one. Uh, it means that you are in real business. Um, by saying that EY, for example, does the auditing of Google. Um, or 
Coca-Cola. Uh, I'm inventing it, I'm not sure. Uh, so auditing, meaning a company that checks that another company is doing what the law requires it to do, has been going on for a long, long time. It's why the world works. Now, who is checking, no, who is doing what? The auditors. Now, if you work in this context and you start using the technical word audit, auditing, you're pointing immediately as a legislator towards a market. Market where companies are auditing other companies and they are then accountable themselves for other reasons. You also know that their market is working sometimes not entirely efficiently. Remember the two, three banks that just went ballistic in California recently because they uh, were overexposed uh, in, you know, financially? Well, they had just been audited and they have been audited as 100% pure gold. Congratulations. Within weeks, they were unprofited. So the auditing market is a lot of if there is no problem, don't create problems, so to speak. What could possibly go wrong if you audit a bank that seems to be super solid? Yes, rubber stamp, boom, and the day after, like, oops. Now, how much responsibility are the auditors picking up in assessing other companies, saying that company is okay? Becomes a little bit vague, uh, who pays for what, etc. So ultimately, pointing towards a market where auditing is a market-based, 100% market-based context, can be potentially a problem. That's why I think the um, legislator didn't use that word. And he speaks instead of alignment. So things like the, the companies need to align or comply with the legislation. How do you know they're doing this? Well, you will be evaluating the alignment of the, of the company with the legislation. And you try to avoid at all costs the word auditing. Someone has to check and certify that company A did what company A was supposed to do according to law. So apart from this biological uh, footnote, we start from the good principles. We have seen them. Um, now there's plenty of lists. Remember OECD, etc. Even the Vatican is putting one uh, forward. Even Beijing has one. From good principles, you move to good practices. You do the right thing. To do that, you need some decent, good methodology. Or good means here yeah, doesn't mean necessarily uh, ethically good. It also means not only no that works, that's fine, it's efficient, um, that does the job it is supposed to do. Now this is all no chit chat, uh, nothing particularly special. To do this, you need to have a translation of this is what we are supposed to do, good principles. Mind that at the moment we're talking about principles and ethics because we don't have the EU uh, or AI Act in power. Good principles will become legislation in a matter of weeks, I suppose. But at the moment, we keep it just on the ethical side. So we need to translate uh, all this block here. The good methodology enables you to translate good principles into good practices and validate that that has happened. That yes, is it? Okay, that's fine. You did the right thing. If you keep all this in a box, someone has to certify that the principles have been translated properly into good practices according to a methodology that you can check. It's a decent methodology where the translation of from principles to practice into practices and a validation so that check, 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 check has happened. Who certifies all this? Who says that? The translation, the uh, validation, everything has done properly. Someone again extend. external. Uh, it could be external to the unit that is doing all this job. So this job, imagine you are a a big, uh, which I would say, a pharmaceutical company or a um, um, uh, automobile sort of uh, company, and internally one unit is trying to translate the practice into the practice, uh, practices according to the right methodology with a translation done uh, as it's supposed to be done uh, and um, a validation at the end, no, check, 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 all done. Maybe another unit need to certify that. For example, the legal unit 
certifies that the engineering unit has done everything that's happened. So when I say external, is external to whoever gets a set. It doesn't have to be another company necessarily. The, all this requires support, meaning it's the assessment. So all this process here is that how principles or legal requirements get translated into what you actually do and how what you actually do, according to the methodology, the translation gets checked and how the checking is certified, well, that is overall a matter of auditing by, again, someone else. You don't audit yourself. Someone else does the auditing uh, of you. That's the kind of definition, therefore, that you get. This is something, uh, work that we uh, did uh, back in Oxford with another colleague of ours, who also just finished uh, his PhD, uh, Jacob uh, Merkanda. Um, I'll leave you that, uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, definition. Um, it was predictable that auditing would become something crucial. It was predictable years ago. I mean, that 2021 article um, is part of uh, 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 Jacob's uh, uh, PhD thesis. Jacob has finished his PhD. That's how old the stuff is. Okay. So we started working on this now years and years ago because it was visible. It was obvious that at some point legislation would come. When there is legislation, auditing follows. And I'll tell you something else that is not happening yet, but it will happen. And the question is, how long is it going to take for that to happen? I don't tell you yet what, so you stay awake. But before the end of the lecture, uh, I'll tell you, look, this is also if A then B, if B then C is C then. So there is a problem. Legislation comes. Legislation will require auditing. That was visible about uh, almost six years ago when we started doing this project. Um, so the uh, highlight uh, concept there is consistency with See, carefully dancing around of the, the word alignment, consistency, uh, in terms of uh, uh, making sure that you don't buy immediately. Uh, so we were just following the um, the debate on the AI Act, uh, the um, view that this is going to be a market-based assessment. The promises of uh, ethics-based or at some point law-based auditing are many. Improve governance, and unlock economic growth, ensure ethical alignment, uh, relieve human suffering by anticipating mitigating negative consequences, balance conflicts, allocate responsibility. That's what we do. I mean, I leave that there as, again. Um, it will be on uh, in the uh, recording, uh, which I started. Yes, I'll confirm. Yeah, thank you. Um, or you can just read the paper. Um, but the, so that's why we do it. And obviously, it's a good idea. There are also some limits. Auditing, let me just summarize the main uh, problem. Auditing is a mechanism that checks whether something is in line with something else. It's a matter of coherence, alignment, uh, compliance with whatever are the ethical principles, the rules of the game, the uh, legal requirements that you have on one side. Something says this should be done in such and such way. Something else says, I'm doing it in such and such way. A third party says, true, correct. A says, it has to be done this way. B says, I'm doing it that way. C says, yes, B is doing it according to what A says. Now, unfortunately, that could be the requirement for the extermination of a whole population. It has to be done this way. Are you complying with, yes, I am. I'm no, the, the Nazi in the place. I am doing exactly what is required by the laws. And the auditing will say, perfectly alignment with the requirements. So remember, auditing doesn't guarantee the good values in place. This is the society in which you want to live. Oh, I wish I could live there. That is the future towards which we want to move. Is a uh, sort of a better place than we have now? No, it just tells you that B is aligned with A, and there is coherence with A and B. If A is totally wrong, so will B B. Now, in perfect coherence with the worst possible legislation, the most disgusting, terrible, catastrophic principles 
that humanity has you know, decided to put in place. In a, uh, you could have an auditing of a uh, slaving or you know, slave based system and say, that's exactly how it's done. So we need to be careful. Um, it's not a good in itself, nor is it sufficient to guarantee morally good outcomes. It just tells you that what you have on, on the left is aligned with what you have on the right and vice versa. So on this point, therefore, um, uh, let me skip some things that I want to move uh, forward. Um, auditing is the mechanism. It tells you that what you have here uh, and the certification uh, has happened. So once you've done your thing, the concept behind is either ethical alignment, if you have only ethics, say at the moment, imagine um, that we don't have uh, anything else about the uh, regulation of AI. Of course we do. Notice how the uh, data protection agency here essentially blocked uh, open AI according to the GDPR. It didn't have to wait for the uh, AI Act. So there is legislation in place that has an enormous amount of things to say about how you use this and that. But imagine for a moment uh, that you have only ethics. Well, you uh, have to look at the ethical alignment that auditing can uh, sort of um, investigate, analyze when it comes to the certification of all this going on properly or not. Or once the AI Act is in place, legal compliance, how the company is complying with whatever the rules are. Now, way back uh, when we started this course, I also told you that compliance is not enough. That's why you still need ethics because compliance is just the minimum required in terms of being legally uh, okay. So a company will be legally uh, acceptable if it complies with the local legislation and whatever international legislation applies. It doesn't mean that it's a good company yet. No, it might be, for example, asked to do much more or sometimes much less because what is legally required uh, doesn't have to be done. Uh, so if I do X, I need to do it in this way, but I don't have to do X. I might do much less. When, uh, for example, we had a big scandal in uh, uh, in the UK about the uh, British government some governments ago that were using uh, members of the government. The limit of the law, how they could use their allowance, nothing illegal had happened, but it was ethically really disturbing. I mean, someone had built uh, you know, a, 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 an amazing place for their dog and someone had restored a house that, yes, I know, but so, so there was nothing illegal, but ethically, they shouldn't have done it. In fact, they were punished for it, at least in terms of uh, uh, name and shame. So once again, legally allowed, doesn't mean that I have to do it, uh, especially if the law, you have problems with it, not in some countries. Oh, but I'm allowed here to you know, uh, kick uh, any dog that I find in, uh, in the street. I know, but that's not nice. You know? Just because you're allowed, exactly. And vice versa. Just because that's what the law says, it doesn't mean that you cannot do much more and much better. Well, that's the minimum salary required. I know, but you could give more money to those people. Huh? <laughs> no one says that the minimum is what you have to give them full stop. It's what you cannot give less than, but you can always give much more. A bonus at the end of the year. Ah, who knows? So ethical alignment, legal compliance, and this, oh, no, so I, I'm glad I have them there. These are the firms. Um, I've forgotten that. Uh, um, not only I have a bad memory, but I have a bad memory about the fact that I have a bad memory. So I forget that I put things there to remind me that I have a bad memory. But those are the four top uh, companies. You can tell that we are in different uh, um, sort of uh, figures 47 billion, 43, 37, 29, and then we go down to one no, less than 10. Uh, that's per year. So it's quite a, a business to be in the auditing of other companies. Deloitte, PwC, EY, and KPMG. Um, uh, these are the 10 accounting firms by revenue that oh, uh, I think this is uh, probably a year old. Um, uh, so it's gone up. I'm sure it hasn't gone down. Um, so the company they like. Remember when we said, and you still find things around, so, oh, the end of the job for lawyers. Remember what I just told you. All those things done by lawyers now are done by AI. This. It's a gold mine. More legislation, more compliance, 
you will have buildings full of lawyers, uh, not only by these companies, but also companies like Google who have to have, you know, they, as they say, this is a verb, they have to lawyer up to make sure that they are protected against the potential auditing going you know, south or sour, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not quite sure when you know, the lawyers start telling us that uh, for them, uh, their jobs are over. Certain kind of jobs, surely, but others are just not uh, exploding. And this is what is going to happen if you have, at some point, compliance, auditing, and a market-based uh, assessment. There are plenty of tools. Again, I just leave that uh, there. Uh, this is another research that uh, we did uh, with Jacob again, and uh, Jessica Marley, uh, who is also coming to an end uh, with her PhD, um, uh, back in Oxford, um, another colleague of ours, uh, uh, Emmys and mine. Um, it's probably to be updated uh, as a paper that's published in 2022. Uh, these uh, tools uh, pop up constantly. The difference that I want to call your attention to is once again, oh, <laughs> I know that I'm not a very nice guy, but you talk to people that, oh, there's legislation. Yes, there is. Not only there is plenty, there's auditing. There's a business about auditing. There are tools to do the auditing about legislation. So we are 25 laps ahead. <laughs> That letter about you should legislate, we have tools to do the auditing about the legislation. <laughs> How many years ago have you ever checked what is going on? These are tools that have been around for a while. And the F and T means whether they are more technical or they are more framework. Framework means you know, a lot of words. Basically, you should do this, you should do that. Technical means that you also have software to do it. Again, checking uh, that things are aligned. Some policy recommendations uh, that we did in also uh, campaign. If we want to do auditing properly in the future, we should follow this kind of uh, basic um, principles. I'm not sure we are. I hope so. Um, it should be standard. There should be plenty of guidance. Facilitate knowledge sharing. There should be plenty of um, oversight. Um, this is crucial. I'll come back to this. Incentives to do the right thing and political leadership. I'll come back for a moment to four and six. Four, oversight. Who controls what? We always have that problem. We always have it. But ultimately, um, the only way of solving who controls what is to go full circle. It sounds like uh, it's a bit of a, a strange logic, no, a circular way of auditing or controlling or checking or allocating responsibility um, and therefore accountability. But when people start talking about who controls the controllers, but at some point, either you stop with people not being controlled by anyone else, or you go back all the way to the population who elects the politicians, who select the controllers, who, the, who then are accountable to the people who would select them. That's why we have elections. You have to go full circle. So who controls the controllers? They control that, to put it shortly. And that's how you close the paradox. The only way of getting out of that, if you think that at some point there are controllers who are not accountable to anybody, well, that is just fingers crossed. They will not do anything nasty, not a strategy. You want to have them accountable, of course, to another external entity, which is the one we started with. So people vote, politicians, delegation, companies, the whole no, structure, it doesn't matter how long it goes, ultimately there will have to be a return to those who have the sovereignty to delegate power, et cetera. I'm all on this, um, not sure in these lectures, but next year uh, when uh, we will do a lot of politics of this. And of course, political leadership, which is uh, something that we lack desperately everywhere. Uh, if there was a time when political leadership was terribly needed, uh, this was one. Of course, during a revolution as deep and profound and challenging as the one we are undergoing, you would like to have people in charge who have a vision and have a sense of what needs to be done, or you not know, the intelligence of knowing, understanding, and even consulting with other people. I mean, instead, you know, we have you know, look at the Italian government, uh, look at what happens in the UK, look at what happens in the US. I mean, three democracies. Uh, you don't know uh, which one is worst. And at the moment, you know, with Biden, we know so bad, but Trump is on the corner. And the very fact that Trump could be re-elected, that really makes you the best. I mean, the very idea that we haven't, not only we haven't learned the lesson, 
but we might go through that again. Disgraceful. At least we don't have Boris Johnson uh, in the UK, but we did have Boris Johnson repeatedly. Uh, and of course, we have uh, the most uh, sort of right wing government ever seen by this country until not, not back to the past when they were actually fascists and they would, would call themselves what they were. Uh, now we have you know, a most right wing government ever. Of course, the first thing that this government did, uh, the uh, uh, right wing, was to eliminate anything that got to do something with digital. Because, of course, the digital is not the future, it's not what we are undergoing now. So all that work done by the previous government was put on a side. There is no ministry or no politician in charge of the digital development, growth, industry, et cetera. Innovation as large. Uh, and you just think, well, uh, blind uh, as a bat. Um, but because we want to be a little bit more optimistic, um, there is a problem also of legitimacy. We come to the end of this lecture. Who has the legitimacy? to set up the whole process and judge the whole process. Well, in our case, because of the EU legislation on AI Act, uh, we're talking about European Commission, Council of the European Union, the European Parliament, there are different uh, areas at the EU level where the legitimacy is exercised to make sure that the process is built, designed, and evaluated as being in place correctly. In other corners of the world, uh, things will be, uh, of course, uh, different. Um, sometimes you have, like the US or China, now governments locally, uh, the legitimacy is with a single government. In other contexts, uh, there would be probably um, a lack of legitimacy. Um, it, by the way, legitimacy is what it is. It, it's not either good or bad. It's just not who has the legitimacy, legally uh, speaking, of so, uh, designing, implementing, and uh, enforcing the law. Uh, you could be a dictator and still be, in a way, legitimate if you have been "quote unquote" elected uh, uh, according to the local rules. The legitimacy—that's uh, one of the last points about this uh, auditing—is um, uh, therefore uh, one of the uh, political issues. The other one is how you do it. Now, once again, I'm referring to things that we've done with our research group. Um, it's a bit embarrassing, so I apologize for the self-advertisement. The reason uh, that there is so much self-advertisement in this particular lecture is because we did a lot of work before other people. So this uh, is the first and at the moment, as far as I know, the best um, methodology to do uh, conformity assessment, re-auditing of AI system in line with the EU um, uh, AI Act. Um, it started a long, long time ago, uh, collaborating with a German consortium uh, led by Volkswagen. Um, I was asked to uh, start developing this methodology. We could all see, uh, it was a meeting at the UN, we could all see this happening, so we started developing this. At some point, that didn't quite work, it became too commercial. We decided to go purely academic. This is open access on uh, SSRN, and I think by now, this is an old site has been downloaded, uh, this was when we first put it online. That down with more than 10,000 times. Um, I got more uh, uh, startups contacting me and say, Oh, can I use it? It's, it's there, it's yours. Uh, Enjoy. Uh, if you want to try your luck, um, you're welcome. Um, I don't recommend reading it. It's 90 pages and it's deadly boring. Trust me. Uh, maybe the aspect at most. Um, but no, so this is the other thing done. Um, this is what happens next. And now for the people on, uh, uh, especially if you think about uh, launching your startup, this is your chance. <laughs> um, the super simplified line of reasoning. New technology pops up, generates problems. Problems, sooner or later, legislation will take care of it. Legislation requires compliance. Compliance means Someone has to check that the compliance has happened, means auditing. But also, the whole process means the companies don't like problems, they don't like risks. And the translation of risk into cost is called insurance. I don't want to have the uh, risk of my house burning, therefore I'm happy to pay a premium now, say 100 euros uh, every year, in case no, that risk should uh, uh, materialize. So, translational cost into, uh, sorry, there's no risk into a cost, 
insurance. We don't have a real market at the moment for insurance against AI-based risks. Is it coming? That's logic. I guess it's going to happen. Yeah, it's not around, not yet. Uh, there might be you know, a company or two around. Um, there might be something uh, like vaguely sort of cyber security related, for example. There is a blooming um, uh, insurance um, sector in the United States protecting against uh, ransomware. Uh, yes, uh, but it's not exactly what we're talking about here. But you can tell companies, ransomware, problem. How do I insure myself against the problem? Here's the premium. Thank you. So if you want to have a startup and make a lot of money in the future, don't forget uh, uh, who told you. Uh, please remember, we always accept donation at Yale of any kind. No, no dollars too small. Um, and uh, uh, because that is the future. Another bit of the future, uh, which I want to highlight, something that Amy and I are working on uh, with some other colleagues um, here uh, at the University of, and it will help me, more than a more than a, yeah, uh, is machine learning. Um, I think both Amy and I were quite surprised when we bumped into this um, uh, area of machine learning. Um, it has been around for some years, so shame on me uh, for not having bumped into it uh, earlier. Um, years means three or four, uh, even five years or so. It's just at the beginning. Um, this little sort of uh, diagram here is uh, almost like a caricature, uh, but I hope it helps to explain what's going on. And it's something that I'm ashamed of not knowing, but someone who is in the legal profession and spoke to OpenAI and asked OpenAI to remove from that, they should have known. I mean, I, I'm supposed to know, but it's describable in the following way. So it's, when you do some training of, say, ChatGPT, uh, you get a model um, out of that particular training. You've got the data, you do the training, the model A, imagine not recognizes uh, cats and dogs. It learns how to recognize all cats and dogs in the world. Uh, some of the um, output of this model may not be wanted. You don't like it. Not only it recognizes all cats and dogs, but treats all human beings with glasses as dogs. Well, that's not nice. But that's not very far from the actual reality. I remember the gorilla Google um, online. If you don't, just just look. The machine learning now they had a bit of a problem in discriminating between gorillas and some human beings. Now all the same, uh, dark skin must be that kind of gorilla. So unwanted. Uh, whether ethically, legally, because of PR, because it's bad business. In any case, you don't want that particular sort of outcome. So how do you remove the unwanted? So you have to do some unlearning. You have to put the paste back into the YouTube, so to speak. So there are ways of doing that, enormously expensive. So imagine that this model has learned about cats and dogs, but actually you want to have a model that has only cats and not the dogs. One solution, which is a solution that we normally adopt right now, is to throw away everything, check the data, remove, say, the dogs, leave only the cats, retrain, and you will get a system that recognizes cats. Now, that is hugely expensive, both in terms of resources, time, and efficiency. So one way of doing this is to reverse the process and unpeach, or un, or make the system unlearn about, say, dogs, so that you end with only and only, all and only the uh, information that is available. From that point onwards, uh, the system will recognize only cats, never dogs. Now, if this sounds a little bit so too fanciful, um, um, we uh, now this is another paper that where you find a little bit more uh, of mine, it's more recent, uh, June 2023. Uh, let me see if I not, uh, didn't put anything in. So this uh, is um, the, the paper that Amy, uh, as first author, and I are currently working on uh, with a number of other colleagues is Understanding what kind of jealousy or, uh, or jealousy, I need to decide how to pronounce it, um, all this generates. Now, the jealousy, as I prefer, um, is, stands for governance, ethical, legal, social implications. G E L S I. 
In the European context, you find else the ethical, legal, social implications, or sometimes ethical, legal, social impact. I can bear. I like justice because I think the governance is also important in terms of implications. And recently, I like to read the E both in terms of you know, not just uh, ethical but also environmental. So you get a full so, uh, picture. What implications this technology has in terms of governance, ethical, environmental, legal, social implications? Let me give you one so you have a sense that it's not just philosophy but you know, speculation. This could be, you know, cats and dogs, and so on. So, uh, fine. But imagine a company ends up by having a machine learning that has picked up something that it doesn't cast the right light on the company. For example, say ChatGPT decides that okay, we should really be a little bit more open-minded about post steaks, or we should be less open-minded about normal meat and be you know, more careful because now they're vegetarian people, etc. So the training gets undone, but for reasons that are opaque. So not only now the training has been done in a, in a, in a way that it's not transparent, but the untraining, the unlearning is also done in a way that it's not transparent. Now, it might be just an exercise in PR, okay, or it might be an exercise in um, political silencing. Suppose you are in a country where the government decides that some information now, they were okay in the past, until five years ago. But now really, maybe not, uh, not so much. So the unlearning becomes the tool through which, instead of having to redo everything, which might be incredibly expensive, especially if the system has been around, has learned more and more interacting with users. I mean, that is all immensely valuable learning that you were throwing away by starting from scratch, you just unlearn that part that you think, you know, from now on, they better not know anything about horse stakes. I don't think so. Not in this country. Horse stakes, whenever you ask for that, you just get a big scolding and say, don't you dare. And again, I'm keeping this light uh, because you know, we are in an in international context and I, uh, there's no need to be offensive or irrespectful towards any culture or any place. Uh, each of us can imagine in their own countries something that might be a little bit less visible, a little bit less available through our learning. So back to uh, Amy's paper and ours, etc. Uh, the jealousy um, implication, of the jealousy impact of all this is not trivial. Uh, not only we have social media now that are, of course, coming with a particular shape and perspective and oriented, but you also have something that increasingly we will rely on this on a daily basis. Or oh, imagine uh, someone who is actually able to hijack the uh, chat GPT of the, say, pension system. And inadvertently, in terms of uh, what the pension system knows, starts uh, fickling with that thing. There are sort of uh, dangers here. Um, there's also so-called uh, poisoning data uh, sort of mechanism in cyber war and cyber attacks, whereby you put the wrong data here so that the or system learns the wrong kind of things. Well, something like unlearning could also be used in defense context, cybersecurity. So it's not like a neutral say, oh, wonderful, now we can also undo what we did. Well, the undoing comes with you know, equal, equally significant problems as the doing. But we almost come to an end. So I um, kept telling you that all this uh, is covered by a number of, uh, of reasons. It is a big chapter in the well, super big digital revolution thing. But the last st stuff that I told you in the debate on auditing, it really is, again, chapter analogy, part of the debate on digital sovereignty. I don't remember what we covered this last year. I'm looking at some of them. We did cover a little bit of digital sovereignty, uh, but it certainly will be a topic for next year. Anyone who wants to be here uh, listening or online. Next year will be much more on the politics of, uh, of uh, information, of digital politics. Um, and um, digital sovereignty, of course, refers to who has the power to control what. As simple as that. And when it comes to the digital, who has power over the control of the cables uh, under the sea, of the warehouses and databases uh, in my territory, or what happens online? Who controls platforms? Are other platforms 
again, one of our colleagues, Josh, who also just finished, uh, Josh Kaus, I mentioned again, uh, from the Oxford group, uh, his PhD thesis is on uh, platform governance. And um, it's interesting to see uh, which platforms govern other platforms. When uh, uh, Parler was, uh, and or Trump was deplatformed, who decided? Not the government, not any tribunal judge. Uh, it was a bunch of companies who decided enough is enough. We don't like this game, so unplug. There is a lot of subtlety. Uh, now for that, um, I just want to remind you that, uh, so the future of AI is this divorce, uh, is not uh, the marriage, so we're going uh, right, we don't go, uh, we're not going left. Um, introducing uh, this topic of not now ending the uh, um, close topic, but coming up out of the sort of uh, mirroring and uh, narrowing in and going back to uh, a wider perspective. Um, it is clear, and I've been saying this for a long time, so forgive me for re repeating the point, that technological innovation, digital innovation, is so much not the challenge. It, it's what uh, is um, around us, um, of course. It can be interesting, it can be problematic, but the real difficulty is what you do with that digital innovation. So the, the governance of the digital. So a better phrase there would be not digital innovation, but the governance of the digital that makes the difference. And the countries, cultures, um, bits of the world that will get the governance of the digital right, those are the winners uh, of the future. Those who will sort of miss the boat, I think that that boat can be uh, sort of taken another time, that their train is not leaving. Um, they will be the losers. Uh, focusing so much about the innovation side and not enough about the governance, it's a big historical mistake. Now, the, of course, digital innovation, um, let me just see, yeah, uh, it's the last one. Um, these days, you also know that is happening either at the very uh, startup level, uh, two or three people, normally uh, of a young kind of uh, aspect, uh, yeah, so uh, the usual kids um, who might have a new idea um, or uh, happens in big companies when they buy the startup. Uh, if you look at uh, digital innovation done uh, by Facebook, uh, Google, um, Amazon, uh, Apple, they buy startups by the bucket, even just in case. Sometimes to kill any potential competition, Sometimes way ahead thinking one day it might be useful. Uh, other times because they know that that is right now what would they need in terms of innovation. There is no point in innovating inside, in-house. I just buy it on the shelves. So innovation uh, happens uh, a lot outside the big companies. It wasn't the case in the past, but these companies are becoming mature as everything else in life. Now, once you start thinking that some of these companies have been around for half a century, like IBM, uh, well, then you start thinking, okay, uh, how much sort of nimble and agile and innovative and disruptive are they going to be? Or is it be more of the same? More, no, not one camera, two cameras, three cameras. Amazing. <laughs> like, I'm sure that poor Steve Jobs is rolling. It's great thinking you call that innovation. <laughs> But that's not a very mature company uh, that, of course, now is uh, banking on um, augmented reality and coming with that kind of budget, with that kind of cloud, might actually make a difference. But it isn't like, wow, how did you possibly think of that? <laughs> Everybody in Zanko is trying. Um, uh, the, um, when, uh, when Facebook bought uh, Oculus, um, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way, as a, uh, as a uh, company, uh, meaning that not only was absorbed, it was bought and absorbed by Facebook, now Meta, but even the name Oculus doesn't exist anymore. I think it was uh, uh, eliminated uh, months and months ago, but not years. Um, it, was, it was an important event, uh, as usual, big uh, event in London discussing uh, AC Meta. Oh, no, we're talking. Uh, you double check six, seven years ago, eight years ago, a long time ago. I mean, in terms of technology, ages ago. Uh, big meeting in London, they need the usual philosopher, so yours uh, sincerely, uh, get there, and of course, back to your uh, 
wonderful things that this Oculus will do, virtual reality, we will live uh, you know, in the metaverse. That's been a decade, uh, at least, uh, of that sort of uh, discourse. And uh, so any questions? Like, so I'm there, of course, well, well, actually, how about your business model? Oh, I've lost of advertisements. And what happens to the data of people? Oh, it will be wonderful. We will be monitoring everything. We will see where you look, how long you stay on a picture. We will know whether your heart beats fast. Or so. That's not that's not real doing at all. So and the so conversation ended there, I know, bypassing each other. The philosopher quite concerned about no, the immersive uh, absorption, absorption of any possible kind of data, biometrics, and, uh, by technicians who clearly did not see the problem at all. They looked like it was uh, no, uh, so the ultimate solution to uh, collect and more about us. Of course, no, fast forward not several years, uh, I don't know if you have already discovered uh, online at least when Oculus was built, um, uh, and we have the same problems. Like, what is going to happen to us uh, in that context? But no, governance uh, hopefully is, uh, if not uh, the solution, certainly not part of the problem. It shouldn't be. Now, with that, we stop here. I know we have a bit of time uh, for the Q&A, which we didn't have yesterday. Tomorrow, um, we uh, have the lecture on, I change a little bit some of the uh, sort of order, we'll discuss uh, complexity. And hopefully, on if you do, if I'm quick enough, um, I will cover, cover also a bit of the digital utopia and finish on Thursday with digital utopia. I'm not sure we will have time for the semantic capital, but if you do, I know. Uh, well, or as all good parties, that will be for next year. <laughs> okay, well, stop. Let me stop here uh, and see whether there are any questions uh, in the room or online. Uh, so we are recording for those of you who join us late, uh, just in case. Um, participants here, um, any questions over here? Please, uh, you have to come here so that, uh, sorry, for uh, those of you who haven't joined us before, uh, this is for the people online. My question is concerning the auditing. Is it okay? Better? Okay. My question is concerning um, the auditing of AI, and AI is not only producing verbal data, but as well visual data. And I'm going to frame this in a little example. When you have the prompt, the car did not fit in the parking lot because it was too small or too big, it would give you the answer, um, the car did not fit because it was too small or too big, right? Uh, but if you put that same prompt in Dolly, Dolly does not only deliver, deliver yes or no, it delivers at least four pictures of solutions. And then you could do variations, and then you get like gazillions of pictures with visual data, visual answers, which actually shows that there is no a priori true picture in the beginning to build up our, you know, verbal language mm. on. So my question is how to audit that kind of data that's being produced as visual data. Oh, thank you. Um, so this, uh, the question, um, now how to audit, for example, um, a, uh, a piece of software uh, that generates uh, visual uh, data, or it could be even movies or audio, uh, not just text. Um, so this is it's a very good question because uh, it enables us to explore a little bit uh, what gets audited. That is a big problem because, of course, um, AI, uh, first of all, as you remember from past lectures, there is no such thing as AI as a field or as a technology. It's an archipelago, covers a gazillion different things from DAL-E and ChatGPT all the way to the old fashioned expert system or the little robot that cuts the grass uh, in, uh, back home. So what exactly are we auditing uh, is already unclear. Uh, I'm not bypassing the question, I'm just stressing how difficult it is to answer it. The second step is, um, are you auditing normally one of the three things? The people in charge of, so are they doing the right thing? And that's, so independent of whatever the pictures are, what gener generates what, is say that unit within that company, have they followed uh, the law? Have they followed the internal protocols? Are they in line with the no, company state ethical uh, principle, etc.? And or are you uh, auditing the processes 
that are in place. So forget about the people. It's what goes on in the company. Now, this, um, for example, um, something a little bit more complex that I'm generating a picture. Uh, well, let's go back to the example of the bank and the, the mortgage delivered or not delivered. Well, there is a process whereby someone applies, the application goes to an office, the office evaluates that, uses a piece of AI to evaluate that, the answer comes back and say the mortgage is given or not given, independent. Is this whole process from the input to the output? Okay, according to the law. Okay, so you look at the AI Act or the GDPR, the, the privacy um, regulation, et cetera, and says, yes, this, no, the law has been respected from the input of the application for a mortgage all the way to whatever the mortgage was. Or, and again, and or, not just the people, and or the process itself, which is just, it, it needs to be formalized. Box, 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 no, check, check, check. So, because at some point, if the auditing is not okay, you need to know when to fix it. So what went wrong, where, because the auditing uh, process didn't, uh, was not successful. Or third, um, the actual piece of software being used. So is this piece of software, for example, say ChatGPT or uh, the DAO E, or in that case, some, some say machine learning that has learned uh, credit rating of people based on some um, parameters? Are the parameters legal? Has there been, say, a bias, a discrimination? Is the person not being denied the, the mortgage because it was from the wrong, wrong quote unquote, emission, wrong quote unquote, skin, uh, language, uh, provenance? Uh, gender, etc. If all these things have been uh, duly uh, observed and implemented, so these are all protected characteristics for the legal people in the room, um, well then, then, no, that's okay, uh, and no, all it in pass. Fine. So you need to know what gets audited, the people, the process, or the software, simplified, according to what. So the people according to what practices, you know, the uh, process according to what procedures, and the software, in this case, according to what kind of legislation. If all this, hopefully all three, pass the test of the auditing, then now congratulations, no, uh, gold medal, uh, and you are through. If anything doesn't work through, then you either get uh, a scale system, say, say bronze, silver, gold, shall we say, uh, improvable. This could be an internal auditing, for example, by a company. That happens all the time. That unit is not performing well, according to what? According to these parameters. Why? Because those people, those processes, that software didn't quite perform well. In what way? Well, it can be improved. It can move from, say, bronze to silver. No. Or you have an external legal uh, thing and you get a ticket or uh, no, you get a penalty. And something no, uh, went wrong. Um, there is a punishment because the law is enforced and the company didn't pass. So it has to pay whatever needs to be paid, et cetera because the, the, the procedure uh, was not in line with the legislation. The difficulty, so this is all, it seems, it, it's not, I mean, just that's the way it is. I mean, it's complicated, but no. The difficulty happens when you start looking at the software and the software is not a piece of technology. It's not a product, it's a service. This is what the AI Act doesn't quite get right, unfortunately. There is a reason why, uh, both historical and practical, the historical reason is that anything that's got to do with auditing normally is about product safety. You audit, say, the car industry because you want to make sure that the cars coming out of that company are in line with the legislation, they say, of emission safety belt. No, okay, do they work? Do they have it? No. Or the airbag doesn't work. Recall all the uh, all the cars, fix the airbag, send them back to the et cetera. But that is a thing. It's not a doing, it's a something. Much, much easier. Because remember when we discussed now the kind of ontology that we are developing in this course, et cetera, more about processes and relations rather than entities, blah, blah. Well, once you shift to an ontology of processes and relations rather than an ontology of things, entities, substance, I think if you get a better sense of the world, but you lose in terms of pragmatical pragmatic sorry, uh, solution. So historically, legislation about safety and risk has always been about product safety. I normally use the example of the uh, microwave. 
A microwave does whatever it does, and it has some ISO, no, International Standard Organization, so uh, framework that it needs to respect. Wherever you go from Australia, uh, oh, sorry, Australia to Alaska, <laughs> if you open the door of a, a microwave, it stops working. So you cannot hook your hand. Great. That's ISO, that's compliance, that's auditing at some point. Someone audits the company that makes sure about that. Historic. Pragmatically, it's much easier to do it. You get the thing and you look at the thing and does he have the property that he should have or not? If he does, great. If he doesn't, fix it. Or if not, out of the market. Now, with uh, machine learning, forget about AI in general, but no, robotic and so on, just the machine learning, the, uh, the, uh, say the large language models or the, any neural network that n learns from the data, the, what you are auditing is what it does, not the thing. Uh, what do you look like? Not how many nodes and how many links and what thresholds and what parameters or uh, that would be uh, useless. And moving from, again, in the analogy, microwave to cookie, that is really difficult because anyone is, has his own way of cooking. So the same neural network, the same, say, um, machine learning as a service provided these days by plenty of companies, they, 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 the usual suspect. Amazon, Google, and so on, who provide machine learning as a service. My company could use it one way, your company in a completely different way. I need to audit how you use it. Not the, not, not the thing, because there is not a thing to uh, sort of uh, assess. Now, the AI Act, it's about the thing. Most of the AI Act architecture is based both pragmatically and historically on product safety. And therefore, it treats AI as if it were a microwave <laughs> and wonders, where do I put this microwave in a scale from zero to five in terms of how risky it is? Now, think in terms of legislation about toys. A toy is something. Can I buy this toy for a three years uh, baby? Yes, it's written there. Someone is certified or we think that that is a good toy for three years old. No, two small pieces. They could actually, no, that is for 10 years up. That's what we've done with AI. We have put AI at the European legislation into a scale from total safety, no, it's a toy for everybody, <laughs> forgive me for the analogy once again, to something that you need to be careful with this. I want to know exactly what it is, not really how you use it, not what it is. In this case, let, let's talk about um, the uh, biometric uh, AI. Well, biometric AI, could be used for amazing purposes, totally safety, not only uh, safe, but also very useful, uh, especially in, say, critical circumstances, say, airport, terrorist attack, or nuclear power station. You need to know who comes in and who goes out 100% certainty. So you triple the double checks, biometrics, card, fingerprints, you, et cetera, or, which is the war here in Europe for no, population monitoring and surveillance, and I put it in a stadium just in case. Now, legislation doesn't work in, not in this corner of the world in the just in case. Just in case you put everything in prison and you start releasing people just in case, they are okay. But just in case, everybody's guilty. That's the sort of massive monitoring surveillance society in which we don't want to leave. So the European Parliament discussion is, which way are we going to classify this as highly risky and therefore any company using it will have to really sort of step up in terms of what the auditing looks like, how you use it, how far, for what purposes. Is there uh, no, a reason for using it? Is there a moderate use only in so much, in, in as far and as much as you need it? It's a proportionality principle, et cetera, et cetera. Or are you, for example, using your company to monitor everybody who not walks down the corridor? I mean, you are a toy company, for goodness sake. No, what, was, what, what could possibly go wrong? Or are you, for example, a university to check whether the students actually show up? Or as we know, in some countries, the usual China, to not check whether students are paying attention or not. Well, sorry, but that's not. But then the debate is how you are using it. It's not the technology in itself. And yet a lot of the sort of history of the AI is about the technology. The technology is dangerous. The use is dangerous not the technology. Now, if you start shifting, sorry, that was a good question, so wrong answer. If you start shifting to auditing the use, then 
you also know that someone somewhere is using it. So it's not the technology per se that is audited, is how some people use it in some way. So the technology is in the middle and it might be you know, prone to misuse by all means. Now, if you have a biometric technology, inevitably that can easily be you know, misused, overused easily. But who, for what, that makes you no know, the left and right are the real things that you want to audit. The technology in itself, all you can say is like, yes, it's not very accurate whenever you no know, it needs to recognize that sort of um, uh, way of walking. Uh, and, or the, uh, the uh, fingerprints or the face recognition, it works perfectly fine. Okay, maybe that's for a uh, hospital apply, uh, application, or maybe it's just uh, what I use every day in terms of not, not going online, etc. So I want it to be working perfectly well. There's nothing wrong in working perfectly well. It's how they are using it that worries me, and who is using it for what. So that's that is what needs to get audited. But then we're back in the close here in who does the audit uh, companies and companies are being assessed by whom the debate which is still kind of up in the air depending on who is talking etc is will there be a say sovereign national european some kind of authority that will be checking the companies to the auditing properly of the companies using ai or will we have some kind of as we here even in the united states a super agency that controls how AI is being used, which I think is not a good idea. So it will be something like, for example, what we have in, in Europe for uh, pharma, uh, we know pharmaceutical, we have an agency that checks that the pharmaceuticals that we have in Europe are okay, but it's not a pharmaceutical company. It's the pharmaceutical companies that get audited. Uh, AstraZeneca get, gets audited. Uh, in fact, we did one of the projects we did on auditing was with AstraZeneca. And, uh, the agency, the European agency, controls that everything is okay. That the companies are doing what they're supposed to do, that the, uh, the ODD is okay, that the extra blah, blah, blah. Now, that seems to me the reasonable model towards which we walk. We need some uh, a supervisory uh, sort of uh, agency that looks at the whole process, but it doesn't get involved in doing it because doing it, not really their business. Uh, so back to your point, uh, you know, DAL E, et cetera, the images and so on, um, it's auditing DAL E doesn't make too much sense, uh, nor does it make much sense to uh, audit the pictures that are being used, uh, are being produced, because that thing, you know, it, it does what it's supposed to do, so to speak. Um, the question is, who is using DAL E, for example, for what purposes? So if those pictures are used, for example, to uh, discriminate, to abuse, to uh, um, uh, for some unfair uh, impact, and if the, you know, the, the agents behind uh, are you know, wrongly uh, uh, or mis say, should we say misled in its use or uh, they, they have uh, evil intentions, et cetera, well, that is what needs to be done. The tool itself is the microwave. Um, but in this case, it's the cooking that, that matters and who the cooker is there, no, who is doing what, for what purpose. Not easy, uh, and I'm not sure uh, we'll see uh, the end of this debate uh, at the moment. It is one of the things that uh, I mentioned several times in these lectures where we need so much more understanding. Now, that's, that's as it were, the end of the road in terms of how much we have understood so far. So the question is actually when um, Dali delivers the answers, it's not just saying the car is too small and that's why it does not fit. Dali delivers visual possibilities of all kinds and creating atmospherical situations of a car parked you know, in a different parking lot and it creates like visual answers that are much richer in the answer than, uh, for example, ChatGPT, who would say, like, would say the, the car does not fit because it's too small. Yeah. And but that the, doesn't, that's not part of the auditing problem. Uh, but, but the thing is, information has, if, if I look at it, different levels of abstraction and visual data is what we, that's the most uh, intake. We have eyes, most information intake is through eyes. 
and most output is through verbal language. So it's actually, it, those are two communication systems that we need to control as well. And I know visual is very difficult to control because it's not precise as language, but um, we're yep, using yep. it. Yeah, no, so this is all uh, correct and interesting. Um, I don't think it goes under the auditing agenda. It goes, for example, under the agenda of ethics, for example, or a different kind of legislation, for example, privacy. Uh, uh, it might be a matter of um, uh, uh, understanding, oh, as we saw before, uh, in terms of who owns those, those images uh, and who can use them for what purposes. So there's a lot of other issues that uh, um, affect um, the output that is, as you said, much richer in this case, uh, or imagine not the output that is a video that is even not richer uh, than an image, you know, it's not moving, the, the suggestions, and it could be a propaganda video, for example. So, but it's not so much a matter of auditing anymore um, in terms of is it in line or not with the legislation, because that's what auditing is about, is here we have the rules of the game, remember, rules of the game A, and it might be the wrong rules. We're not talking about correct or wrong or uh, I like it or not. Rules, whatever they are, does this follow or not? Does this comply or not with the rules? Now, anything else, now some of the issues that you are uh, raising are fundamental, but they belong, seems to me, to a different kind of discussion. It's no longer does it or does it not abide. But it's more in terms of is this acceptable? Is this something that we want to, for example, show to people? Under age, uh, I mean, does DALI, for example, generate pornography easily or not? Uh, it may, it may not, depending on how it's trained, depending on what circumstances and sort of constraints have been put on the, uh, the training. So all that uh, doesn't belong anymore to this sort of uh, kind of game that we have here in terms of rules, uh, compliance or not, unless, of course, you no. Know, you said, well, one of the rules is that it should not produce uh, uh, pornography. At that point, does it or does it not comply? Uh, the richness of the content and therefore the impact that that richness has on individuals is fundamental. It has something to do with the semantic capital, which we're not going to uh, discuss. Um, but I was trying to make sure that um, we, we stay as we were in this lecture on the strictly legal compliance, not compliance. Yes, it does or it does not fit uh, with the current rules of the game. Um, if we want to expand the rules to say, for example, that say under a certain age, people should not be exposed to that richness or influenced by them, that is again fine. It, the, the rules uh, treat them as an empty box. Whatever you put there, what well, the thing on the right needs to comply with those rules. Um, what those rules are, well, that is for another kind of discussion. Are they the correct rules? Are they wrong rules? Do we want more? Do we want less? Etc. I don't know if there's anything else uh, before I get carried away too much on this topic. Please. We will come back to you on the chat. <laughs> Professor, uh, uh, you you, uh, during the lesson, you, you talked about the frameworks um, that we use in uh, actual uh, the uh, uh, modernity and the uh, and the contemporaneity. Um, what are it's two questions? The first one is more broad, like what are the challenges um, that you see that the philosophy is calling the, the philosophy is called back to um, co contribute. To, to interpret it, this new era of the, the digital ethics and so on. What are like the new challenges you see like for today that are very urgent and philosophy must uh, uh, improve and collaborate with that maybe what we are working on. Mm -hmm. So the other question is about the auditing. Um, I, uh, you, you, you said before that uh, auditing doesn't uh, uh, allow or uh, uh, guarantee that the good values of a society that we could say that maybe we would have like three or four big worldly models like United States, Europe, China, maybe Russia or other mm -hmm. four kind of different models. Um, well, could you uh, explore more this idea because um, uh, auditing maybe is the less resource of uh, the compliance, but uh, I agree that uh, uh, it can't uh, uh, 
uh, uh, comply or, uh, or, or guarantee that the good values must be applied in society. Uh, but if not auditing, what could be some kind of way of working on like uh, ethics, auditing, um, and in the last question, the third one is could be what are the challenges of auditing in the health sector? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I think we have enough for the rest of the day. Uh -huh. um, so first of all, I I'm not going to give you all the secrets about what we need to work on. This is uh, like that's, that's precious material on uh, on which to write important papers, um, apart from jokes. Um, so what philosophy um, should do today? Um, I refer back to some of the uh, topics we covered during the lecture, so at least I hope they will sound familiar. Um, just yesterday, for example, we were talking about AI as a new form of agency, and I told you that if you pick up, if you look at the uh, entry in the, stand, in the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, SAP, and you look at the agency, it's all human agency. It's mental agency, it's intentional agency, agency with a goal, teleological agency, presupposes mental states and therefore responsibility. The one thing that, uh, and just an example, um, if we are really facing a new form of agency, meaning by agency, something that can make a difference in the world, it needs to make a difference in the world. It doesn't have to, but it must be able to. So that can make a difference in the world and can learn from the difference made, so it collects data from the world and can improve its performance once that sort of uh, feedback has happened. In other words, that can interact with the world and learn from its interaction. I don't like interaction and I don't like learning for obvious reasons of vocabulary, but no, now we know that you know, there are no horsepowers, et cetera, et cetera. That, that to me is an agent. Now, for your average philosopher, he will say, no, that is rubbish because it doesn't have a mental sort of uh, attitude, it doesn't have a plan, for example, or intention or interest or um, a goal to pursue it. Well, that is something that either philosophy gets an update or it's outdated. You know, welcome to the real world. That is an agent. It makes a difference in the world, changes according to the rules that they made, learns from that interaction, and doesn't have mental states. No, you're welcome. <laughs> so we need a, a better understanding uh, philosophically speaking, or what agency means. Um, if philosophers like it, great. If they don't, history would just pass them. Because you, know, you can't simply say, I don't like it. I want to have mental states, which I get normally as an answer. The last book I published, uh, and it's still forthcoming, The Ethics of AI, the in English version, one of the reviewers exactly said that. The book is all about artificial agency, but it's no such thing. Like, how do, what can I say? Like. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> well, at least uh, prove me wrong. Uh, but the proof was like, it needs to be much richer. No, it doesn't. So is this kind of a pizza margarita level? Oh, I need no more on it. I want to have ham and anchovies. You don't have to. No. You can have the most basic form of agency, which we then need to understand in terms of governance. Of blah, blah, blah. That's one thing. Another thing that I will talk tomorrow about is how uh, another problem, uh, just to tell you, you know, where, I'm, where we might be going and I stop there otherwise. For a long time, uh, especially modernity uh, is, and I'm oversimplifying and it's not very nice to oversimplify this way because people feel that they're very smart when they oversimplify with a single story that explains everything. It's not like that. So it's a caricature to convey uh, a few bits of things that I hope are understandable. The caricature of modernity, which I hope is not too far from its real identity, is the age of the I, I don't know, of the uh, Cartesian cogito. Uh, and as an age of the I, and therefore an age of individualism, um, increasingly uh, becomes less and less responsive to problems that require coordination among many individuals. A lot of the problems we have cannot be solved by me doing the right thing. No matter how a saint I am, I stop eating meat. I never turn on the light. My shower is always cold. I only walk, not a car. And when it's cold, I freeze. The world will not notice. <laughs> I die as a sad, 
<laughs> cold, meekless individual, and the wall will just burn to hell because I did not coordinate my effort with not the other seven or whatever billion people on this planet. So when you are told, oh, and we get this all the time, do the right thing, save the world. No. Doing the right thing as an individual is for other reasons, not because it is useful. You start thinking that I do the right thing because it is useful. Since it is useless, I shouldn't be doing the right thing. And that's what other people say. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, nothing changes. Yeah, doing the right thing as an individual is not a matter of it is useful or it's not useful. It's a matter of, for example, not spitting uh, on your face when you look at the mirror in the morning. <laughs> I'm not that kind of individual. Um, having some self-respect or uh, being able to tell other people that, yes, I did my part. But there are the reasons, but not because it is useful. So what we need is a theory of coordinated action back to agency. Do we have a theory of coordinated action? Not so much, because the age of the individual or the individual or the age of indiv individualism, the age of, of the eye, has increasingly shifted anything that needed to be organized efficiently on competition, which is a great engine. You find you know, all the people here competing you know, for some limited goods. We will all try our best, and society improves to some extent. But competition is not the right way of getting people to work together. So look at science, for example. Now, science is a collaborative enterprise. But for, let's say, post-war onwards, so to speak, big science is competitive. I get the money, you don't. I get the, 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 the whatever benefit, whatever you know, um, uh, publication, re re registered so, uh, bit of this or that, um, you don't. You live into a competitive environment where only competition is the rule, and you don't escalate to problems that require collaboration to be solved. The simple example, I will bring that tomorrow, is you push, I've done this a million times, so especially those of you who have heard me before, forgive me. You've got a car in the street that doesn't move, and it takes five people to push it at the same time. Going there as an individual, as a modern Descartes, I go there, I push, and I come home, and I say, I've done my duty. I sleep sound at night because I did push the car. That was useless, not only, but now you will also feel good about it. And that is you know, twice the problem because you haven't done anything and you feel good about having done nothing in the sort of false conscience, you now uh, bits of modernity or philosophy here, of the false conscience of someone who thinks having done my duty as a individual, it takes, it takes five people. And it's one, two, three, push. Global warming, social injustice, unfairness, legislation, all the problems we have today are all unsolved and mounting because the modernity from the eye and the cognitive and everything else is fantastic in generating competitive uh, value, but a disaster when it comes to putting, incentivizing people to do things together better more. The reason why politics is going nowhere is because it's also another context where we have created only competitive uh, politics. Politics today, now America is a classic. You read the Constitution, I, I'm going to stop here, but uh, the, the Constitution is, is so beautiful. It's that we the people, it's the, the, the most beautiful incubate of a, of a legal text you can imagine. We the people, and it goes on, and it tells you what they want. It doesn't say, John, Mary, Laura, Amy, Luciano. It's not a long list of whatever millions we've got. No, it's we the people. That we has completely disappeared. There is no bipartisan. It's a fight, everything against everybody else. And above all, I don't care. The country could go to bananas as long as my party gets you know, the extra. We almost had a crisis financial because the two couldn't get together on not raising the debt ceiling. And it was until the very last moment. As long as politics, science, our society, economics is all about the I, the individual, and competition, which is half the engine, no, we, we're flying, no, obviously, in the wrong way. So the other side, which is literally the other half of any game theory book, no, collaborative games, incentives to work together. The, the three C that I'll tell you tomorrow, no, the, the, the um, uh, uh, coordination, collaboration, cooperation. 
I mean, we live in a, in a particular region in Italy where this is, she's famous for this 3C, and it shows, <laughs> it does. And not just because I'm here, I'm here because it shows, not the other way around. So pushing, for example, philosophy to elaborate a philosophy of contemporary time that is based on, for example, a new kind of agency, a new form of 3C. And I close here, based on tolerance rather than justice, well, that's already, you know, <laughs> I can see it's the office for a while. Because, and that's the last point, because I know it's too late, forgive me. Um, uh, modernity, so also, and this is actually much more accurate than the caricature before. Um, there was um, immediately in a post um, uh, religious war, John Locke, uh, who is famous for his political thinking, despite the fact that people like me studied him because of his epistemology, which is nothing. Now, founding father, uh, as were, and you know, influencing uh, the American Constitution, etc., liberalism, and so forth. Uh, his work on uh, tolerance or toleration, depending on the terminology, um, he, he argues quite simply, said, look, if you want to have a, a peaceful society, now, and we just came out of you know, religious wars to no end in Europe, you now Christians you know, having a massacre against other Christians, and then we laugh about other people now, but we've been there uh, and not abundantly so. So for whatever religious reasons and economic behind, we are destroying Europe. Locke says, look, if you want to have a peaceful world, you need toleration. Toleration brings uh, peace. Excellent. Fast forward and uh, uh, you find that uh, John Stuart Mill much, much later and says, look, you know what, uh, if, um, if you want to have uh, freedom, well, and a free, and once again, toleration will bring uh, all this. Toleration enables freedom, enables uh, a peaceful society. It can essentially, pay one, bring up home, bring home free. That's a good one. In between, so to speak, uh, logically speaking, Kant comes and says, you want to bring everything home? Justice. Justice brings home, uh, not tolerance, but instead of tolerance, brings home both freedom and uh, peace. And so after Kant, the whole uh, legal, political thinking, uh, so much behind the actual thinking that we don't even see is so such a, a, a presuppose, it presupposes so much that it's the background philosophy behind the background, is that a decent society is based on justice. Well, not necessarily. A decent society could be based first and foremost on toleration, which then could be also leaning on justice. So, for example, a political theory or a political philosophy that revisits the whole modern uh, uh, project, which is justice first, anything else will follow. In terms of toleration first, anything else may follow. But well, that would be an immense project. I think it's the 21st century. So a new form of agency, we don't have it. A new theory in terms of toleration first, instead of justice, we don't have it. It keeps going. So, and this is just scratching the surface. So what the heck are we doing in any financial department these days, not talking to each other and not to whatever old people trying to understand did Aristotle really said or not said this and that? I have no idea. Because honestly, the, the world is screaming for some help with this deficit, conceptually speaking, that is enormous and widened. But now we've taken 15 minutes more than was required with this monologue. I'm so sorry. Um, I think we should stop here, despite the fact that there are other questions, because it, it is late. Uh, we start again from the question, I promise. And if I forget, uh, you will remind me. Yeah, OK. Thank you for the patience and apologies for the monologue. Um, I'll see you tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you.